Hello, hello, hello. Instagram family. Good evening, good evening. Good evening, good evening. Hey, Patrick, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Man, I'm fantastic. Fantastic. I'm getting us all lined up here. Am I sounding good so far? I think someone said there's no sound. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear hmm. me? No. Dallas sounds distant. You can't hear me. Turn up the sound. The sound is up. The sound is up. Okay, I'm getting a few. Sister Vera, give me a one, two, three, if you can hear me. That's good. Getting some of them. All right, good, good. So now we're going to go over to Instagram. Hey, family, y'all, we are just getting started. Give us an opportunity to get all of our um, connections in place. We worked on this hard last night. Yeah, we worked on this real hard last night. All right. Here I come. Here I come. Now, you're on Facebook. Is that correct, Patrick? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. Okay, so now we're getting ready to load up Instagram. All right, I'm coming on right. Okay, there we go. All right, let me find you. Ain't that something? I'm glad this is for the broadcast. <laughs> All right, I found you on Instagram. Okay, there you go. I'm starting to feel a little techy. You're going to be running the whole thing here soon. Doubt it. I really <laughs> I'm still Can you hear me? Uh yeah. Mine's my Instagram. There we go. Let's see. Can you hear me, Patrick? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you excellent. Uh-oh. Oh, okay, I was about to say, we shifted. <laughs> I can hear you. I'm working this thing out now. We still got a few minutes. Uh-oh. What happened? I don't know, but I'm back. Oh, <laughs> uh, so thank you for watching. 
So you got it. Kick gotta... me out. Okay. All right. So now. That's yeah. You're still trying kick... to get in on Instagram on Facebook. It, uh, I'm on Facebook. It kicks me. It kicked me out of Instagram. I All was right, on let's... there, and it... let's try it again. Okay. Hey, everybody down there on Facebook. we got another few moments. It's not showing me that you're live on Instagram. Well, that's not good. <laughs> this was not what we practiced last night. <laughs> it definitely was not. But we will not be defeated. We will not. There we go. Here we go. Mm -hmm. There oh, I okay. am. There you are. Live and direct right there on the ground. See if it's going to go like that or not. All right, I'm waiting for you to jump in my screen. We're going to go to work. Here we go. Here we go. Send request. I see you. There we go. Patrick wants to come on and get live. Connecting. All right. I don't see you yet. That's weird. To all of you all who are listening, neither one of us profess to be um, uh, social media giants. Yeah. Am I still on up there? It, uh, Instagram's my Instagram's pausing out on you, and then kicking me out. Let's see if it'll let me back in. Nope. Let's try it one more time, Patrick. Let me make sure that I'm still on. Yeah, now it's saying you're not even live anymore. Yeah, something's going on, so I'm I'm coming back right now. There we go. Okay, there I am. Now if we can and just I'm, get you. Let's see. Hey Shirley Pickens. Okay, I see you. And I sent a request. Okay, let me get into your request here. Okay, I'm close. I'm one step closer. Here we go. Let's try it and add. Great sound and picture. Thank you, Sister Vera. Connecting. Yeah. Come on, Patrick. Come on. Come on. We can do it. We can All right. do it. It's showing me on there. I don't see you on Instagram. Man. It says connecting. But you see you and me? Uh, wait, hang on. Now you are, uh, yeah, I, I see both of us, although you are timing out now. Yeah, and I'm not even doing that. So I know what, let me, let me, let me do something. 
Last time, y'all. Last time. Last time. If not, we know Facebook is rolling. We know Facebook is up and running. Mm -hmm. That much we do know. Coming down again. We had this so smooth the other day. <laughs> it was it was rocking last night. I promise you it was. It was absolutely amazing. So Sarah says once Dallas, you try and put add me in, it then pauses you and kicks out of the live. Right. And I'm struggling even now to get on, get on. Mm. Guess what? Live and direct right here <laughs> on Facebook Live. It is Deliver Us From Evil. <laughs> we tried, I love Patrick. It. We gave it we, our I, very best. We even showed up last night. Make it we work. Were awesome last night. We were literal tech geniuses last night. <laughs> Literal tech geniuses. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to segment three of Deliver Us from Evil. I am not, uh, I, I, I'm just excited. I am Dallas Wilson, and the good looking fella is. I am Patrick Devane. Patrick Devane's church is in Maryland, and I am in Atlanta, and we are excited to have been gifted with this gift from the Lord to come together, two pastors, African-American pastor, a white pastor, pastors a white church, and uh, I pastor a predominantly black church, and we came together to talk about race, religion, and the long road ahead uh, here on this medium, and it has been absolutely phenomenal. Pat Patrick, how has these past two weeks uh, been for you? Uh, what has it done in your ministry? Um, talk to me. It has, uh, so these weeks have been fantastic. It has been fantastic to hear the conversations that have come up, um, both in my own house, but also in our church conversations about looking at things uh, from a different perspective that they had never been looked at before. Things like, how do we view police? What, what, is it, what ways are sort of the casual kind of racism has infected our world that we don't even know about? How can we re-examine our own experience in a way that asks new questions from different perspectives? It has... Uh, one of the things I've been most excited about is seeing the comments and connections both weeks, both previous weeks, with members of your church and members of my church sharing back and forth, sharing resources, sharing ideas, sharing commonalities of things that, you know, we, uh, we, haven't, we haven't ever met in person. And yet the comment section where they're, you know, pouring out their heart with openness and honesty has just been a blessing. Uh, Patrick, I echo the same. To be honest with you, uh, I love your commentary. I'm not concerned about mine, but when we get offline, I am in the comment section as well, listening uh, to family members who haven't met each other yet, embracing yes. each other. And guess what? They're now three weeks in with us. They have made friends and relationships. And for that, I am. That is a blessing that I never would have thought uh, right. would have been gifted to us. To be honest with you, I thought there was going to be blood on the dance floor in the <laughs> comment section. I had yeah. no idea how it was going to go. And I want to say something uh, to you and, and to myself. That is probably, it's got to be that we have lived such a life in front of them that they wanted the same thing that we wanted, and that's to begin the conversation and begin to love someone that you have not even met yet that has a different skin color. And that has blessed me 
tremendously. So I listen, I am a part of you all in Maryland, and uh, you all are a part of us here in Metro Atlanta, and we will never be divided again. Yes, yes. And it not it just like God to bless us in ways that we couldn't imagine? We, you know, we, uh, we plan out our, our plans and get all our ideas in place, and then God does whatever God's going to do that's so much better and more abundant than we could imagine. Most definitely. And to my personal growth, my personal mm. growth in this area has been tremendous. You have opened my eyes in ways that I would have never experienced had we not met, had we not conversed, had we not spent the time conversing off camera, the times of prayer, simply because there was something in you and me that we really wanted to make this right before God. Even yes. if we had the wrong answers and the wrong approach, we wanted right. to set a table that people felt comfortable to come to and simply express all the while with the love of God inside. And that was, that, that was a gift that I will treasure until that day comes. It has been absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. And you think about all the places and culture that shut down conversation, that emphasize shouting, shouting heads, just trying to shout each other down. Right. And you, you read the Gospels, though, and you hear the way of Jesus, and you see someone who listened, who paid attention, who saw, who perceived, and met people where they were. And you know, my connection with you and my friendship with you that we have developed through this has been such a blessing to me. It has opened my eyes just the same. And, and uh, you know, that, that is all glory to God with, with all the ways in which God works blessing upon blessing upon blessing in ways that we couldn't, couldn't have even hoped or imagined. Listen, it, it has broadened me in areas that I did not want to be stretched it mm. has opened my eyes in areas where I wanted to remain blind. And it has alerted me that if we don't do this, we are not honoring what the Bible says. I am still haunted by Second Chronicles that says, if my people, and I just remember praying that prayer for years and challenging God, why aren't you finishing the rest of the verse? Why aren't you doing the rest of the verse, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, uh, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal the land. Man, I literally had been praying that. And I've been praying it until my prayer time was just raw from praying it. And I had to ask God, why aren't you responding and God said to me, it's because when you pray, if my people, you're only praying with one people. You have not mm. expanded it. And I am so much more of a God than just your local congregation. I refuse to be named as the black church God or the white church God. Uh, I right. want to be God of all. And that was the greatest gift for me to know that if we're going to honor God's word, it's just not my people. It has to be all people. Right. Absolutely. And it is, it is so easy to, and I can speak for me, it's so easy to insulate yourself and believe that your story is the only story. And until you do the intentional hard work of not just, again, not just, Talk, you know, not just showing up to somebody else and shouting your story at them, but listening to them until we do that hard work together. Uh, we're not going to it's not going to be any better. And the church has to lead because nobody, you know, you don't get ratings by listening. You get yeah. ratings by shouting. Right, right, right. So we're, we're doing the hard work, man. And and this has been one of the greatest blessings to our ministry, and I pray it's the same. I'm looking at the con comments. Hey, Sister Sarah Rudolph Devane, thank you so much for being a part of this. It, it's a blessing um, to I us. I like her. I yes, like her. Yes, yes, I, I, I'm sure you do. How long have you been liking her? Uh, over 10 years I've All been right. liking her. Wonderful, 
Wonderful. What what a blessing. Let's go to work, Patrick. Tonight uh, we are talking about, uh, again, race, religion. And tonight we're adding in relationships. We've talked through many things um, from our first time together. And we've talked about the riots. We've talked about uh, the injustices that we've seen uh, in regard to policemen handling uh, people of color. Uh, it's still very unfortunate with all of the worldwide media. Uh, it's still happening. It's still happening. And I've even seen some videos uh, with even black people, officers attacking black people. So it's not, um, it's not just one uh, race that's doing it. Uh, but I've seen some others that horrified me to know that with all that's going on, they couldn't censor themselves and think better uh, about their actions in this situation. We've um, we've seen we've seen all sorts of you know there there are people wound up, and I, I'm sure you see and talk to people the same way I do with all the pandemic, with all of the injustice, with everything going on. You see people wound up so tight. Uh, it, is, it, it is a travesty and it is awful. And you just can feel the tension in so many places. Most definitely. So, so one of the things that you we talked about in our time off camera, what is now as we see it, because we're here and we're going to claim to be the experts for this moment. <laughs> 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 what do you think the role of the church in the black community, what is the role of the church in the black community and the white community, the charge and to challenge? What are, what are the differences in our roles? Well, I, uh, I'm fascinated to hear the, your perspective on the role of the church in the black community. Um, if I'm going to step in and be the spokesperson for all white people and the role of uh, the church in all of white culture, um, there's, there's probably three different groups, uh, three different ways that white people approach the church. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are the, probably, unfortunately, the smallest group are the really actively faithful mm -hmm. that span all denominations, that show up every week. They're the ones you want babysitting your kids. They're the ones you want bring, bringing the casserole. These are the ones who show up, but this is a smaller and smaller group. There is a group that is tangentially co connected to church so that, um, you know, if, they, if somebody were to press them on something, they would say, oh, yeah, 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 I go to this church, but, you know, they haven't darkened the doors since Easter or Christmas. And the, there is a bigger group of these people the, in my perspective, the group that I've seen that's the biggest uh, or is becoming the biggest is the group that fakes no allegiance to church at all. I mean, they, they have no interest and no desire. They have either had a bad experience with church and so have decided it's not for them. Or I've even run across people that are second and now third generation families that have never been connected to church at all. And for them, it is as foreign as if Martians showed up and tried to explain to them what life on Mars is like. So when I, I have a joke with my congregation that's not a joke. When I go to a party, I try and not tell people what I do for a living because I either get, uh, they either completely shut down conversation and leave immediately, or if they're in that second group, they feel guilty. Think about all that they've said before. Have they said a bad word? Have they done something they shouldn't have? And then they give some sort of lame, my uncle's first cousin goes to church right. as if I'm taking role right there. And so, our, so the church in, I sell that to say, the church in, in white culture doesn't have a position of authority. It has to work subversively. It has to work through example, and it has to work relationally, person by person by person, because there, are, there is so much derision, there is so much scorn, and there is so much suspicion that, uh, except in places, very rural places, and even that's changing, the, the culture of church, if it doesn't lockstep with politics— 
the culture of church is ignored. That's the, I've been, I can't tell you the number of times that I say Jesus would have us do this, and the word that people use for me is naive. You can't do mm. that Jesus stuff in real life. So that's... So for, for white culture, the church can't stand up and proclaim something and have the culture respond. We're too busy with sports and entertainment and making money and fighting about politics that we can shut ourselves off from that message. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. That, that was heavy on, on the mind. Uh, we share some, some similarities I, I want to say, and again, I shudder to speak for all of Black America, but I believe that church has always been prominent in our lives. And if I would chase it back to uh, the plantation, um, that was the first place African Americans had some level of freedom. On hmm. Sundays, the masters would leave them be while they went to church and the slaves went and had church, obviously, in a lesser facility, um, but they had church. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. My mother, who grew up, uh, who's 80 years old, grew up in Helena, Arkansas, and she remembers the big white church being across the street from the black church, and they could hear each other. And she told me this comical story that the white church would be singing a song on their side of the street says, will there be any stars in my crown? And across the street, the black church was singing, no, not a one, <laughs> no. Okay, I'm so glad you laughed because that was either going to go very good or bad. Okay, thank no. you. Yeah, so, I got so you. I believe that the church was this first institution that blacks had some level of authority. Think about it, all week long, you were a boy, uh, you were a slave, but come Sunday morning, you got to put on something, rags or whatever, and you had these moments of worship um, and you were unhindered. So church to the black generation or to black people from my experience, uh, and I would go back several years. It was everything. It was it, mm. it, it was everything. If you didn't go to church, you knew where the church was. You knew where the um, you knew the pastor. You knew something. In my home, there was church or die. There was none. We we had no other place to go. That was all we had. So even the African Americans and people of color who may not be a part of a church, when they're in need, they're going to come and find a church. Hmm. They will walk up on the church and come in, never seen them before, and present uh, themselves and even display their need. So the church in the black community, I want to say, is probably the first institution that we had any level of authority that we had an opportunity to worship God, that we had an opportunity to pray and to sing. So, so the church in the black community, it was everything, Patrick. It was the hospital. It, it's, the, it's the counseling center. It's, it's the food bank for those who are hungry. It's, it's, it's everything that black America needs. The church has been uh, uh, that, that spiritual Walmart we literally need to have everything because it's probably the one institution that people feel safe initially. This mm. is the place that's supposed to help me. Whatever mm -hmm. I present to them, they are supposed to help me. It doesn't matter if I'm a member here, they are supposed to help me. The church also raises generations of believers, uh, I think in both of our, our, our um, existence, that it raises a group of believers. That as the Bible say, even if they go off from it, at least they'll know which way to come back. So the church in, in the black community, man, it's, it's, it's everything. At least it was in my childhood. Now I've seen a great falling away, but it's still a very pivotal place 
in black America. Hmm. So the, so I, I hear you saying it's, it's the, it isn't just the spiritual hub, it's the relational and communal hub of the community as well. Most definitely. Most definitely. Okay. We, we have to do more, uh, number one, because we're, we're in the community. And the mm -hmm. community is going to look for us. It, it's not uncommon for people in the community to come to the church and ask us to go talk to the police or go talk to uh, the powers that be. That for some reason, well, not I know the reason that we are that spiritual entity that they just feel like we're going to be working for their best interest. Right. It's it's interesting because the uh, you know that that understanding of you are in and of the neighborhood and community fits very very closely to my understanding of the theology of how of what church should be of of the people and for the people that sort of idea. There are so many white churches that are struggling uh, through all sorts of issues, some their own fault, some not, to even just survive that they, the, they create a vicious cycle. They, mm -hmm. turn, they panic because they see the money's not there, so they turn in on themselves. They close themselves off to connecting and helping other people thinking they can't do it, which then creates sort of a circular firing squad where they're all just looking at themselves, almost ensuring that they're not going to make it. And there are so many churches that are so inwardly, selfishly focused that they have turned their back on community, they've turned their back on service, and they have uh, unknowingly signed their own death warrant. And that, that keeps so many, at least white churches, from even having the conversation about how they could serve or help serve in a meaningful way. Uh, when, when you are a church in, in a black neighborhood, you have no choice but to serve because the mm. community has needs that the yeah. church has to meet. It, it has to meet. It's not uncommon uh, for people to, again, to knock on the door and are in need of food. And they expect the church to have a response. I don't need to be a member. You're the church. You're the answer. You're supposed to have the answers to the calamity. And you know what? I think we should. Oh, I yeah. think we should oh, yeah. be able to respond if they can't get water here, if they can't get a word yeah. here, then where shall they go? Uh, I, I want to, to move. So the role in our community, man, we're everything. We're the hospital. Uh, we're the attorney. We're the doctor. We, we are child care. We are everything. And in your community, how would you sum up what you think the community uh, how the community sees you? I think individual churches are going to vary widely mm. because of, depending on, they, they have the privilege and availability most times to just be insular and selfishly focused and still survive, at least up until recently. So for some churches, the, the community answer would be, who? Who is that? Where, where mm. is that? Right. I think in our, you know, I think in our case, we have made an intentional effort to uh, deal. One of the areas that we have poured ourselves into is hunger on a, the peninsula that we live on uh, has some some really uh, pricey homes, has some really expensive things. And people see themselves as better, not better than necessarily, but better. But there's a lot of hunger and there's a lot of need. And so we've poured ourselves into that. Uh, and I, I would hope one of the things, you know, one of the things that I always talk about and try and challenge my church is, is that question of if we close tomorrow, who besides the members of the church would even miss us? Uh -huh. And I, I think I could say that there are, there's a fair number in our community that would miss us, but we're always trying to ask that question to see what else do we need to do so that we are serving God's kingdom. So in, in light of what we've been talking about with all of the racial tension, um, you being the white church and I being the black church, I want you to give a mandate 
for what you think the black church needs to be doing at this time. And I would like, while you're working on yours, um, I, w I want, it just came to me, what do I think that the white church could be doing at this time? So this was unprepared. This is not in our notes, but it just came to me. What, what do you, as a white pastor, what would you say to the black church that we should be doing at this time? Woo. Uh, yeah, that's heavy, man. I'm glad you're going first. <laughs> I, I was about to say, uh, you, uh, you really set me up here. Uh, so uh, I would, um, in, in some ways, it would be similar to what I would say to my own church in that I want for you, for every action, thought, word, deed, anything that comes from you, I want it to be shaped and formed by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit, which means you're going to have to do stuff you don't want to do, which means you are going to be put in a position where you're going to have to forgive people who you'd rather not forgive, and mm -hmm. you're going to have to love people you'd rather not love. And I would, the only way that I would say that to your church is if I was saying I'm putting myself in there too, because that's my responsibility as well, that I'm not smart enough to know the man, the answer and the specific, you know, white pastors, we, we have, uh, we're, we got an answer for everything and, and we're going to give it to you, whether it's good or not. And I'm trying to repent to that kind of arrogance. And, but I do know that the spirit has the answer. And mm. so what I would say is you all need to check me and I need to be able to check you. We need to be in relationship well enough so that we can say to each other, okay, where, where is, where's Jesus in the midst of this? Where is the Holy Spirit working in you right now? How are we going to let that power inform the, the race relation conversations we have, inform the, pol the politics we have, inform the families that we shape and and raise what are we going to say to our kids it better have it better be formed by what jesus and the holy spirit is empowering in us you did well you did very well all right all right uh wow um so i guess i set myself up as well what would be my my mandate or conversation to the white church um that would be that if we chase scripture and we believe the word of the Lord and that God started with one family being Adam and Eve and that from that one family, all the nations of the world were created. I would say that we are, we're family. Mm. We're, we're darker, but we're family. And I, I would say to the white church that if we both love the same God, we have to learn to love one another and stretch ourselves. Yes. Stretch ourselves to a place of uncomfortability to have uncomfortable conversations that make both sides uncomfortable because we're never going to get anywhere with your doors locking up at noon and, and our doors locking up at noon and nobody's having the conversations. We're, we're watching the same television. We're watching the same horror. And we, we need to have the conversations because everything starts with the conversation. You know, yes. what, what, what's, what's, what's going on in my church may be completely different. But can you imagine what would happen in the body of Christ if we started the conversations? If yes. we just begin the conversations that you like you and I are having that uh, down the road, if something else uh, happens where there is more violence, you and I will have the conversation and we'll both have something that we can take back to our churches to share. We can no longer be sanctified houses inoculated by the signs on our door with our eyes closed to what's happening in society. When I look at it, Patrick, um, if I count up the hours of the day that the church is open, 
during regular time. Let's say we get there at eight o'clock. We're leaving. Um, we're leaving church, walking out by twelve. What is that? Eight, nine, ten, eleven, 12, four hours. Bible yeah. study. Give us three hours in the building. So that's uh, uh, that. Add the three. That's like seven. So so mm -hmm. add on some more administrative time. So out of seven days a week, we're occupying the church to what maybe. 15 hours of the day where is the church in us that's making a difference after the benediction we are right. experts in vacation to benediction but we are midgets when it comes from benediction to invocation what have we done since the last amen to bring healing or to address the issues that are before us as the body of Christ, there's an indictment on us to open our mouths and speak truth to power, no matter what the color is. And, and uh, so in our Bible study we're doing on Wednesday night, we're walking through the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, we are one of the things that I am continuing to see and, you know, uh, a, the ancient teachers talked about scripture is like this beautiful jewel. And every time you turn, you catch a different facet. So you read the same passage 30 times, but you catch a different facet of it each of those times. And the thing, one of the facets that's sticking out to me now is Paul, not only an example, but also an explicit teaching. When he, you know, all these Gentiles are coming to faith and he says, hey, guess what? You know what being faithful means? You're going to suffer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the second thing on the list. You know, Jesus is number one. Oh, by the way, you're going to suffer. And he then goes and backs it up by being stoned and being thrown in prison and all of these things. And you see in him this example. And for at least, you know, and, and I'm not going to speak my specific church, but in the mm -hmm. generic white church, you stand up and you say, hey, who's, who's going to sign up and come suffer with me? Uh, I could fit them in my car and have lots of room left over. Uh, mm -hmm. And that uh, we, we aren't interested in that. But if, if we, you know, because we talk about, at least some white people talk about speaking, speaking truth to power and flipping over tables, but they're not ready for the suffering that comes with it. And the reality is the suffering is, is part and parcel baked into what faithfulness looks like. And that, that has to be part of the conversation, too, is that it's fine and good. That's that invocation to benediction thing. It's the, you know, we can talk a big game, but are you willing to go out and do it? It's game time. It's game time yeah. in America. And we set up to talk about tonight something that I think is critical. And even looking over my notes, it just enlarged itself. What are we teaching our children about race relations. And I, I, I'm, I'm so ready to hear and also to share, what are we, me being uh, African-American pastor, and I, I've been black all my life. I mean, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you laughed, because I, I, I worked on that one hard. Um, that was a and, good one, that was a good one. And so I, I want to hear and I want to share um, what do we teach our children? What did we teach them? And what would we teach them now after us being enlightened? After yeah. us being enlightened. You, you, you want to you work on that first? Absolutely. Uh, so I subscribed to the, uh, and this is, this, is not a, this is not a boast. This is to my, my own embarrassment. Um, I subscribe to the, I am not going to actively be racist. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to fly a flag of, you know, runner up people. I'm not going to, uh, you know, say in, the N word or frame any sort of thing in my own house to say that, you know, we are going to be people who live the right way, do the right thing, treat everybody the same. And that was, that was, that's where it ended. I didn't, I didn't talk or 
I have not done enough work educating myself on the structures and systemic issues that lead, that racism brings and continues to shower down in its hatefulness. And I have not communicated with my kids all of the other issues and all of the other things, partly out of a privileged selfishness of I don't want to, I don't want to scare them in a world that is full of terrible things that we can't stop. And I have the privilege of not having to have that conversation with them. And so before my framework was sort of this, me and my house, we're going to be colorblind and everything's going to be fine. And we're just going to, let's quit talking about it and just be nice to each other as if that's mm. going to be enough to even begin to address or speak to or not be insanely insulting and condescending to any African-American person that I'm trying to connect with relationally. Amazing. Am amazing. Amazing honesty. And um, you, you, you are allowing me to be honest. I have, and my children now are my 30-year-old daughter, my 19-year-old daughter, my 15-year-old son, and 14-year-old daughter. I, I, I want to be completely honest that I have work to do because I have spewed much of my racial anger on their sandwich, probably yeah. even before they ever came in contact with it. We hmm. moved to a predominantly white neighborhood and therefore that put my children in a predominantly white school. And it was tough for me. There were times when children could have sorted things out, but because I'm here now and I've got to be this strong black father for my children, I've got to let them know this is how you deal with with subliminal racism and and I'm I'm telling this to kids who are seven <laughs> as yeah. if they could grasp it. So so for me, I have to be careful that I don't bleed my blood on my children without giving them balance. Without yeah. giving them uh balance in regard to not everybody is against you. Yeah. Not everybody wants you to fail. Not yeah. everybody dislikes you for the color of your skin. And, and, and I, I, I want you to, if I could do it over again, I want you to learn people for who they are. I want you to make friends quickly, but I want you to leave friendships that are not beneficial uh, to you even quicker. Yeah. In, instead of that, I saddled my kids with all of my stuff and it's taken time. And my kids, after a while, they would come home and say to me, Daddy, it's just not like that at our school. It's different. And here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm cornering my son. Anybody bother you? Anybody say this? And I missed it. I yeah. missed an opportunity <clears throat> to tell my children that you can be friends with whomever wants to be friends with you. You can build relationships with anyone who wants to be relational with you. Please yeah. don't pick friends by the color of their skin. Pick the people you're going to hang out with, uh, I, I hate to use it, by the content of their character. That, that wasn't mine, I didn't write that, that was Martin Luther King. Uh, so, so, I, I know that my message to my kids was heavy on the the side of, hey, watch out for that group of people. Hey, be careful. Why? Because of how I grew up. I did not give my children an opportunity to, to learn for themselves and me guiding them with wisdom. Well... And I, that is amazingly open and honest of you. But I, I think, I think the fact that you can.
reflect on that and see that the fact that you can communicate with them now i i think one of the most powerful things we do for our kids is point out the ways we were wrong and we're trying to change mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think it provides opportunity for testimony in meaningful ways so in your neighborhood where your kids go to school are there a plethora of of black kids there are some there are a mixture of all there we we have a uh diverse place there's um all sorts of uh hispanic kids people from all over because of because we're so close to the state capital annapolis and we're so close to washington dc we have uh, several military bases where people come in we've got lots of government jobs up here so we have all sorts of different people that are coming in and going at all sorts of different times. But my kids have been able to be friends with a lot of different uh, ethnicities, a lot of different races. Um, for them, it, it doesn't even, it doesn't even compute when we talk about it, when we've framed and talked about these things, they are baffled at how people could have this much vitriol and hatred for something to them that seems as arbitrary as hair color. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. I, I remember being at the pool, and I promise you all, I know y'all think I'm a library of stories, but I am. I saved them. I was at the pool in this new neighborhood, and my mm. children and several other white children were playing in the, um, playing in the pool. And this is what led me to the question. And they got ready to play some level of tag game in the pool. And at that time, my kid, the oldest one, might have been 11 or so. And that would have made my younger daughter nine, 10, 9, 10 ish. So we're at the pool, and I'm sitting there with all of my books watching them play in the pool. I was that dad. And um, there was another white dad table across we spoke on the way in so it got time for the children to choose teams for this pool tag and the youngest kid seven years old and somebody said well who's going to be on whose team and the youngest kid about seven or eight years old says how about the blacks against the whites and I paused and I looked at the father yeah. And the father offered me something that um, he offered me something that uh, I still struggle with till this day. He said, I don't know where my son got that from. That was his comment. He never said anything to his son. Just said, I don't know where my son got that from. And I said to him, he got it from you. Got yeah. it from you. And it put such a stalemate. I don't know if they ever got that water tag game going because all the kids heard it. Yeah. All the kids heard it. And then they heard our conversation and yeah. it was, it, it, it took, so I'm, I'm, I'm always focused on what in me can harm my kids if I give them too much. What in you could harm your kids if yeah. we're not speaking to them on a level playing field in regard to race relations? Right. And that, so with uh, how, what has changed, so part of what's changed is we felt convicted, my wife and I, that we needed to talk to our kids about what is going on. And so we explained the situation of why people are protesting, what's happening. We very briefly talked about um, a couple of the cases, but we talked in more detail about George Floyd. And mm -hmm. we talked about what that officer did and you know our daughter is 10 our son is eight so we tried to use we tried to frame it in language they could understand we we weren't trying to 
body slammed them, and but we wanted to be clear about what was happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we explained it, we explained, and as we're explaining it, they both start crying, and they both, and, and my daughter goes, but, but why did that officer do that? And so we're, we're talking, we're saying, you know, there's all sorts of reasons that, you know, there's all sorts of sinfulness, there's all sorts of bad stuff that happens that, you know, there's some people that think that, you know, black people or people with other skin colors are worse than we are. And, and it is, it's like I'm speaking Greek, because again, she's like, what? But how can they think that? Why on earth would they do that? And I said, well, there's, there are people who think that different skin colors are, are worse. And she's, she is just, our daughter is incredibly um, empathetic, incredibly caring. Her, you know, her heart is just all over the place and huge. And she, she's, as she's weeping, she stops and she goes, I don't want to be white if this is what it means to be white. Wow. And, it, and we both stopped and paused and, 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 I, and I said, I said, I'm sorry. And, and she said, I don't want to, if being white means you have to hate people who look different, I, I don't want that. And so we talked about, we had the opportunity to talk about, that's not what it means to be white that, you know, you, and she said, I, I just want to be something else. And, and we said, well, that's not, this is how God has made you. So God has placed us here in this place, in this body, in this way. What are we going to do? How are we going to make a difference? How are we going to show that that's not what we think God's calling us to do? And it, if we had not started that conversation, we would not have been able to hear her heart and we would not have gotten to a place where we could then have the conversation of, okay, what is going to change and how are we going to do it? And so we're still, and honestly, we're still working on that. It's not like that we figured it all out. And so I'm trying to pat myself on the back, but I, in a million years, I would have never thought that that's what my, my daughter would have said. And, but in her brain framing it, it is, uh, it is just utterly baffling that people could be that way. And she wants no part of that. And she'll, she, you know, that is not who I am already. She has a sense of self enough to know that. And so the, it, it showed me not having the conversation has missed an opportunity for all of us in our family to grow. And I have, the disservice I've done is the, is the opposite. I have, I've held back the truth of the world because I, I didn't want them to have to experience it when in reality, they, God has placed them here to help carry the burden in whatever ways an eight and a 10 year old can and for us to help frame and shape that. And so for me, what are we teaching? I'm trying to start teaching now mm -hmm. and even and and i'm trying to be honest about even as i'm learning i want you all to learn with me and that that at least for my kids is such a they feel such camaraderie and connection to me when i say i don't have all the answers and i'm trying to figure it out and will, are you all willing to do that with me that it is it empowers both of us in a way that i can't really explain otherwise it's amazing that the shade of skin has put up a bigger barrier than any wall in the world. Yeah. It's, it, it's so amazing. And the biggest challenge that I'm hearing now is that it's not the children, it's their parents. <laughs> because they can only get what they get from their parents. Yeah. That, that, that's just the God's honest truth. You know, you, you, you can only get what you get from your parents and I'm the first one to admit coming out of New York with all of this anger coming from a, a, a completely, you know, isolated 7% black. There were no white people for us to talk to. Now forget the teachers, the teachers were they were just like, they was black to us. They lived in the neighborhood. You know, they, they didn't, they didn't qualify as white people. 
So we had no frame of reference. We had no one to talk to as a peer uh, concerning race relationships. We just had none. So then you grow up like this and then you hmm. begin to pour the same medicine into your children and it begins to tilt them the wrong way. So, so we have a responsibility as, as black people uh, to be honest concerning our children. We can't be like we do with our boys and girls. We teach our girls one thing to run and hide and we teach our boys to go and chase. We can't do that if we're going to be honest and set up the next generation to be better than we are. We've got to start teaching them and not just teaching them, modeling it. That's yeah. the key. Daddy, yeah. how can you tell me how to treat this person when none of them have come to the house? None of them have come to the... You don't have any relationships, except with Patrick. Uh, you don't have any relationships with white families. So I'm, I'm in an ill position to try to prepare healing for them until I do better. I yes. don't have those relationships. And I live in the community. I'm, I'm, I'm in the community, but I have not made those relationships. That says something about me that there's still some things that I need to work on in regard to sharing with my children. Right. Well, and it is, uh, you know, my, uh, my grandmother and I, my grandmother said this all the time of the do as I say, not as I do. Cause I see her speeding as she was driving me somewhere. I said, grandma, I don't think you're supposed to do that. And she said, you know what, honey, do as I say, not as I do. And that has been how I've tried to lead too, whether it's church leading or leading in my own house and it never works. <laughs> you know, the, the example behind it shines out and teaches whatever your words may be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so let me ask you this, and, and I was going to say three things. Tell me, tell me, uh, g maybe you can give me three things that you would want your children to know about people, um, about black people. What, what, would, what, what would you share with them? What would you want them to know? I. I want, well, I, and I, I hope we can flip this around too, because I'm curious Most as definitely. to what you, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I, what we teach our kids and we, you know, we're, we're, they're leading the way on this is just that, that Dr. King quote you mentioned of the color of your skin is not the determining factor of if someone is worthy of your attention or time. Uh, you need to pay attention to, to the content of their character. Is this the kind of person that is going to help you be who you want to be? So I hope that I hope that you don't. Uh, I hope that skin color is not a determining factor. I hope that you get to know the person. I hope you do the things that. I hope you are in, intensely curious about people who have had different experiences than you, and I hope you listen. When you, I hope you ask questions and I hope you listen. And then I hope that you put yourself in their position and you think, what would it be like to live in their shoes? And how would you want to be treated? How would you want things to change? Those are, those are the things that I want them to be so ingrained in them. They're not even doing them consciously. And I don't know if we're doing that well or not. I guess we'll, you never know until uh, it's too late. But uh, you, uh, that's, that's what we're trying to not only teach, but also model. Hmm. So you want to hear my side now? <laughs> I do. So well, what the, the question was, what do I want my children, my black children to know about white children or, or white people? Was that the, was that the yes. question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I may be in duplicity here. Um, now, enlightened. And, I'm, and I, when I say enlightened, I'm, I'm looking at you. You are a part of my enlightenment. Hmm. Six months ago, 
if I was being honest, we probably would not have had the same conversation. So my cry that came to you on Facebook was an honest to God cry from a dude who was just fed up. I yeah. mean, honestly fed up. I told you before that my 19 year old, if I'm out too late, she calls me. And I said, I'm on my way home. She says, Daddy, no, you need to get home because you're who they're looking for. I said, what? She says, you're the tall, black, that guy. That's, that seems like those are the ones that are dying. Please come home. Hmm. What would I tell my children today, enlightened? Treat people better. Just give them the best until they can show you and give them the best on credit hmm. so that you can yeah. not walk away from something that could have been benevolent to you and a relationship that could fortify. Treat people better than, how, how can I say this? Give people a chance to show who they are. Yeah. Let's not judge them by what they look like or what they have. Or in my case, growing up, let's not judge them by what I don't have. Mm. Let's judge them by how they present themselves to me and how we can carry on a relationship. That's what I would tell my children now. I would tell them it's not about color. It's about character. Yes. It's about how you are treated and how you're made to feel while you're in that culture and that milieu. I would want them to understand that it's less about skin, but it's more about spirit on the inside. It's more about what they've been taught on the inside. That means more to me. And, and I, that's really what I wish. If I could rewind time, Patrick, I would tell my children, you're going to a new school Make friends with anybody and everybody. Yes. But I didn't do that because I didn't know how to do it. So I would change that by telling my children, love people who want to be loved and love the folks who don't want to be loved, but you don't have to give them your airspace. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm, 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 I grew up in a whole different area. I, I grew up in a whole different time and place where we didn't even have the option of talking to. Can, can you embrace that, that I went to a school where there was no white people? Right. So for me to come out and now try to educate my children on how I didn't have the how. Right. I didn't, I didn't have the how until I got to college. And I yeah. went to an all-white college. Figure that. And that's where I learned and I made some lifelong friendships with some guys and girls from there. So I want my children to learn to love people for who they are. And if it goes sideways, still love them, just love them from a distance. Right. That 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 that's just what I came for. As, so, what would you want to tell my kids? Wow, what would I want to tell your children? Give me their ages again, Patrick, and their names. Uh, Piper is a ten-year-old girl, and Andy is an eight-year-old boy, and they are awesome. Excellent, excellent, Piper. 10 year old Andy is eight. eight Andy years is old. eight. Eight. Okay. So I would want to tell your kids that in regard to race relations, man, I think I want to tell them the same thing that I tell my kids. I would want yeah. to tell them that don't let the color of skin hinder relationships. Yeah. Don't 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 let what's different stop us from being the same. Don't let my kinky hair stop you from loving me 
and being yeah. in a relationship with me. Don't let what you've not seen before stop you from seeing what you wouldn't have seen if I was not present. Right. I, I would tell them we're people. We're, we're just different color. My mama would say this in her great Arkansas wisdom, it's skin. If, if, if you remove the skin, everybody's got the same thing underneath. Our issue is skin deep. Yeah. yeah. I think that's America's biggest issue. It's skin deep. Yeah. I would tell you, you can love me. You can, you can love me. You can love my children. You, you, you can love people who don't look like you. Right. And it's okay. It's okay. What would you tell my kids, Patrick? Now, How, re remind me the ages. This is a tough group, man. This is a tough <laughs> group. So I'll give you the ages of, of those who are in my house. My 30-year-old lives yeah. in, in Philadelphia. So I've got okay. a 19-year-old college student going back for her second year. And she is a liberal arts major. And she's heavy into African-American studies. I've got the 15-year-old the who's rising sophomore uh, wants to play basketball, and I've got my 14-year-old who plays volleyball, and she is the most interesting child God has ever made. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so what would I say to them? I would say, what would I want them to know? Mm -hmm. um, I would want them to know I'm sorry. Mm. Not necessarily because of something I've done, but I can be sorry because of the situation that the world is in. I'm sorry for my inaction that may have made things worse. And I would want them to know that I'm working on it. I can't speak for everybody, but I'm working on it. And so if they wonder and question if anybody cares, if anybody's trying, if anybody is trying to do the work and make a difference, this one boring white guy pastor that my dad knows is trying to do that. And that's, uh, that's what I would say. Wow. Wow. That, 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 that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I, I know my 19-year-old is, is, is listening. Uh, that is awesome. Let, let's, let, let me, we, we talked about what has Mar America, or one of the things on our, our, on our notes, what has America shown us here recently about race relationships? Yeah. Obviously, it's still a huge issue. This is, this is not something that appeared overnight. This isn't something that happened because people are tired of being cooped up with a pandemic. This is, this is back to one of our country's original sins. And like any sort, of, uh, any sort of ailment that you don't pay attention to, or, you know, if your check engine light comes on in your car and you just turn the radio up so you don't hear that noise, that stuff doesn't just magically get better. The more you don't pay attention to it, the worse it gets, and, and it erupts out in ways that can't be contained and can't be controlled. So we are, what we are seeing is the inaction of so many, including me, to wrestle with the difficult topics. You had talked earlier about we have to stretch beyond what we're comfortable with. Our failure to do that up to now helps cause the situation we're in. Mm. Wow. Patrick, you, all, you always give me something that, that man, you, you don't give me soup. You give me grits, man. It, it, sits, heavy, <laughs> it sits heavy in, in the belly. And while I was, had the privilege of listening to you, I'm, I'm looking at the comments and I, I heard you say the word, I'm sorry. And I saw some of that in the comments. I would challenge you as my brother that 
you don't have to be sorry because of the color of your skin. Be sorry for inactivity in the skin. Yeah. Don't be yeah. sorry because because I was born white and you were I, I was born black and you were born white. No. We should be sorry, both of us, for inactivity of yes. trying to make things better. I yeah. believe that the question was, what has America shown me? So so I'm I'm here and I am the focal point of America's problem. I am the dark skinned black male. Nobody cares or nobody knows, Patrick, and I don't this is not my normal attire. I've got my New York baseball hat twisted to the back. I got my Jordans on. That's just where I'm comfortable. Yeah. So when I'm not in my pastor attire, I look like what hmm I look like what racist America I'm the enemy. I'm the enemy. So what I want America to understand is it's not good enough to be sorry if nothing happens. Forget a stimulus right. check. Forget all of that. It's not good enough to be sorry if we don't take our so sorrow moves us to do something. Yeah. My, my, my opinion and yes. I just don't think America is ready to do anything because they've had two examples, two examples. I did this research this week and it really lit me up. Two examples. The first one is Germany. When Germany finally overthrew Adolf Hitler, there are no statues of Hitler in Germany. The swastika is outlawed. You can't draw it. You can't paint it. It is outlawed. What it says is that Germany has embraced its wrong and want to eradicate it from their history, the murdering of countless Jews. Mm -hmm. You can't find an Adolf Hitler statue. You cannot find a swastika nowhere. If you go to Rwanda, where apartheid happened and millions were killed, on walls in the streets, there are massive pictures and monuments of hangings, of killings. Why? They don't ever want to forget what happened. America wants us to forget and move on. I live in a state where I'm constantly confronted by had a conversation at the mechanic shop. I think it's wrong that you want to take my family's heritage. Talking about the rebel flag. Yeah. I said, I don't want to take your family's heritage. I just want you to know that your family's heritage flag was also standing by slaves who were hung. That heritage flag ran through plantations. I don't want to take your heritage, but it is a moniker that reminds us of where we've been. And America, in my mind, in my minute mind, America does a poor job of remembering. Y'all should be good now. You should be okay now. We've given you stuff. It ain't equal, but we've given you stuff. America is not ready to embrace its history. And that's why we're still where we are. I read hmm. this this week that we are really not citizens because if you are citizens, you're not fighting for equal rights. No citizen has to fight for equal rights in their own country. They don't. 
So America has yet to embrace or just does not want to embrace. And the reasons why these uprisings rise up, because people are just tired of saying, and I do not condone uprisings. I do not condone the violence, but I understand why it happens. I understand America will not address its ills. America will not address the history. America will not address its wrongs, and therefore it keeps repeating, and it keeps repeating, and it keeps repeating. The, the, uh, the sins of the father visited on however many generations. Most definitely. Most definitely. Um, but this for me, talking with you, has helped me in ways, and I pray it's helped several hundred people online Thank tonight you. in ways that, that we couldn't have paid for a more genuine conversation about race and relationships. Right. That's why we both know that this was a godsend that you and I collided. I threw out my rant. I need to talk with a white pastor. And you say, hey, here I am. Let's talk. Yeah. This is a spark of healing for both of us. You, your congregation have been so contrite. Uh, I, I'm, I'm listening to some of my bros from the hood. They're like, Patrick's heart is pure. I mean, you might end up getting a brother patch on your jacket soon. <laughs> this has been a source of conversation, Patrick, that, that, that is so necessary. Yes. We don't have to be enemies. No. And we don't have to be strangers. Because that's the... It, it, it doesn't have to be that I have to treat you as an enemy. I can also, I can also be indifferent. And that in itself is a tragedy and a sin as well. You know, Patrick, I, I, I want to say because I love you, sometimes it's hard to know what to do. It's Absolutely. hard to know where to start. And it can be very scary to jump yeah. out into something that you don't know. But just the fact that your heart was there. I'm seeing what's going on. I don't like it. Wow, there's this black guy somewhere on my feed hollering about he needs to talk with a white pastor. Let's do it. That is yeah. the beginning. Your church and my church will never be the same because of these conversations. And let me tell you why. We have both put context in each other's pulpit. Yes. yes. My church will be thinking about Patrick. Your church will be thinking about Dallas. How would Dallas feel about this? How would Patrick feel about this? And that's been the greatness of what has come together. Absolutely. The, when we aren't talking in generalities, but we're talking in actual people, that's when relationships are cementing. And that's when, that's when we start getting momentum to do big things. So we, we've talked and we're, we're almost to... Um, our end on tonight and Patrick and I are going to share with you what's happening in week number four uh, I pray that you all stay with us what can we do as a church so, so let's talk about we talked briefly about it what can your church and my church do to hmm what do I want to say here what can your church and my church do to bring us closer. Let me, let me, let me start there. I think we, uh, I think we find ways to serve together. I think that we let these conversations be the starting point, but like you had mentioned, if all we do is talk, you know, that's, that's like saying, I'm sorry, but nothing behind it. You know, that's right. the little kid whose mom forces him to say, I'm sorry. It doesn't really mean that he's sorry. I think these conversations are the spirit's kickstart that then we creatively find ways that our communities can both be pointing toward Jesus together 
which mm. I think will, you know, I, I do this in premarital counseling that if you, if the husband and the wife are, are both heading toward Jesus, you can't help but be more connected to each other. If you got, if Center of Hope is working on finding how they are going to get closer to Jesus and College Parkway is working on that too, and we intentionally do that together, we can't help but find ways that we are going to grow and merge. And again, the limits of our imagination are no limits to the spirit. Man, so so I see, and and as as Center of Hope, light my screen up real quick, so so they'll know that y'all are giving me the authority to say what I'm about to say, even though you don't know what I'm about to say. Light my screen. There they go. Here they come. I'd, man, I love that. Them. There there we go. So Patrick, I'm saying this to you, and my brothers and sisters of Parkway. The Center of Hope would love to work on a project with you. And we want to invite you all to Atlanta, and we can make it work, and we'll yep. have a project that we can come to. But listen, when that is over, and y'all go home and heal from us, <laughs> <laughs> we want to come there yes and work yes. on a project with you all absolutely and, and 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 put because i got some folks now if if you say go look they ain't stopped blowing the screen up now i got yeah. people who ain't been to church in a while who are ready to come to maryland <laughs> <laughs> i would love for my campus to look like a portion of heaven with us working together, feeding the hungry, whatever it is. I would yes. love to see that. And I would love to pack my bags and come your way and work on a project in your city. Yeah, College Park, I think, what y'all think about that? I, I, I think College Parkway is definitely going to want that as well. This is a, uh, this is definitely something that we would be excited about and, Something that uh, we have, we have a couple of, uh, in fact, a couple of people are already have some ideas down here in the comments about what we could do when you all head up this way. We would love to do it. That would just, that would be something that uh, I see them talking about blue crabs. I'm in y'all. We're going to feed you in. some, we're going to feed you some crabs when you come up here. That's going to be what happens. I am in. What and I, I've got my, my friends from New York that still live in New York. They're saying, hey, D, when you go, I'm on my way. So Come on. Come this, on. This, this can be phenomenal. I know we're talking in the middle of the pandemic, but as soon as um, times are better, I want to make this happen. That has yes. to be the logical place for us to go to show the world to show yeah. the world that this can happen and it's genuine. Yes, absolutely. And that this is the beginning. That's all this is, is the beginning. And that's, that, that is exciting to us here in Maryland. That is, uh, that's what we want is we want to be serving and going where God is calling us to. And we want to be doing, doing the good work of Jesus. And we want to do it with our brothers and sisters. I want to be an example. I want to be an example to my church. I want to be an example to my children. I want to be an example to the world that yes. the only difference between us is the color of our skin. Yes. And, and love can make that difference. Uh, yes. and, and, and for that, I am grateful. Let's talk about next week, man. Tell, tell them what's going to happen on next week. So we, uh, we are going to have the uh not the beginning of the end we're gonna have the end of the beginning we are gonna wrap up our conversations with a teaching time and uh we were we were wrestling with what this would look like but what we decided is that the most fitting way that we can show and share how god is working and moving is for dallas and i to share a teaching next week it is going to be less a conversation and more a joint lesson on how God has moved and worked in us 
and how scripture can shape and form that work in meaningful ways. And we are going to tag team on a uh, sermon lesson. What do we want to call it? I don't want to scare them away. What are we going to call it? It's a... Uh, I'm going to preach. I don't know what you yeah, call it. Yeah, all right. Because I'm going I'm going, to I'm going preach too. That's what's going to happen. But, uh, preach, Patrick, preach. So we're going we're gonna to share a sermon next week as a celebration and reflection on how these three weeks, these, this month of conversation has moved and shaped and spoken to each of us, how the Spirit has moved in us, and where God may be leading us forward. I, I couldn't have said that any, any better. That was something that came out of our uh, conversations, and the Lord gave that to Patrick, and I, I was just blessed. You know, I'm, I'm quiet and listening to him. He says, well, you know, I said, well, Patrick, you pick the text and Patrick is going to pick the text and and lead off and and I will close. And um, what a fitting way to come together until we come together again. Uh, mm -hmm. College, College Parkway, you yep. all are stuck with us. <laughs> That's what uh, that's what we say to people when they join our church is uh, you 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 know what you're getting into because you don't get out now and we'll say that to Center of Hope too is you're stuck just as much with us you 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 all are stuck with us and this is going to be a relationship that I pray draws us closer together in kingdom I can't yeah, wait for us to get at each other's altar and pray join hands and pray I I just. I just can't wait for that moment. I love it. I, I love it as well. I, I, I want to thank God for, for Center of Hope, for uh, College Parkway, uh, to, to each of our prospective congregations that yes. have sown into this ministry. And as Patrick has said, uh, this is not the end. This is the beginning. How, how did you say that, Patrick? It was so eloquent. It's not, the, uh, it's not the beginning of the end. It's the end of the beginning. It's the end of the beginning. You know, we have literally just about exhausted uh, ourselves in these three weeks. And, and next week is going to be a great time of sharing. Both of us said we're going to have a week um, oh, yeah. and, and share the gospel. And I am so excited about our time of sharing. And but. I want you all to know that we are connected. We are connected. Y'all will not get rid of me. You know, planes are flying right now. I may just pop up when I feel like it and walk in the church. I'm sure y'all will recognize me <laughs> when I get there. So I am super, super excited. So listen, yes. let, let's do this as well. Patrick mentioned this to me in our, our time off camera. For those of you who have questions, for those of you who have questions, let's do this way so it doesn't get lost in the comments. I want you to share your question with either pastor in our, um, what do you call that? The in, messages, right? Message in us. Our messenger. Message us with, yeah. your, with your questions that we can probably do that next week at the top of uh, the yeah. hour before we go into uh, the homily. So I want you to message either of us. You're, you're comfortable with that, Patrick. I, I know. I Absolutely. Am. Absolutely. So you can message either of, as a matter of fact, let me go ahead and fix it as the big brother. May I ask center of hope? You send your questions to Patrick. Okay. Y'all send y'all questions to Patrick. And College Park, if you so desire. No, I'll, I'll let you say it, Patrick. Let me stop telling College Park what to do. So, College Parkway, uh, you are welcome to, uh, in fact, I would encourage you to send your questions to Dallas. We can, uh, we can make sure that we get you there if you have any questions about how to do that. Excellent, excellent. I love y'all, College Parkway. I love y'all for real. Patrick, you and your family are blessed, man. And I'm so grateful that God connected us together. And next week is going to be a revival. It's going to be amazing. Dallas, we love you, man. We love Center of Hope. And we are so thankful and gracious, grateful to God for bringing this together. 
Amen. Amen. Did I pray us in in the beginning? I, that, you know, that was a long time ago. I don't know. Here, I, I'll pray us out. How about that? Excellent. 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 All right. Blessings to Let's you. Pray. Gracious and loving God, you are continually doing new things, and we rejoice that you are doing a new thing here and now. Yes. We pray for Center of Hope, and we pray for College Parkway. May first and foremost, may we be people of the gospel. May we be so transformed by the good news of Jesus and the spirit living in us that the world can't help but see your kingdom come. God, we pray that as we find ways to serve and work and grow more towards you and more towards each other, we pray that the focus will be on you. We pray that you will get all the glory and we pray that you will continually shape and show us how to better follow your word so that our world can be transformed, so that Jesus can be glorified, and so that we can be part of your kingdom. We give thanks, God, for all of these things, and most of all, we give thanks for the mighty name of Christ Jesus. And it's in, it is in his name we pray. Amen. 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 I love you, my brother. Until next time. I love you. All right. Sounds good. See Bless you later. You to you all.